Awo, Shalom Rastafari. This is the 40th uh, sabbatical Sabbath portion, the Rastafari sabbatical study, Sabbath study, Shabbat scrolls, sabbatical scrolls, and now we're in the book of Hebrews, the Hebrew book of Numbers, known as Bemidbar or Bamidbar. All right, and we're in the 40th portion, and for the disciples, it's crucial to um, get a copy of these these Torah portions, the five Torah portions for the disciples. It's very, very important, and we're seeking to work out, you know, work out the means that all the disciples, especially all those who have who have matriculated or who are in the matrix in the list of um, registered disciples, will be able to obtain. Um, each of the five um, Hebrew books right here for their personal studies. All right, so let us uh, let us get into this right here. So Shalom, again, um, Senbet Salam, Senbet Salam, which is I and I, I and I, Ethiopian Hebrew greeting of the Shabbat of the Senbet. So let's go over some basic points for this sabbatical reading and feeding and once again this is also another very good book that we have to highly recommend let's let's let you get a get a look at this right here this right here which is the the Falasha anthology you should be able to get a copy of it even um, maybe a used copy we was able to get a used copy we had a hard cover but you know over the years some things are lost or stolen or misplaced and so we had to get another copy of it right here. And this is Falasha Anthology, and it's by Wolf Leslaw. It helps us to really recognize what is in our older um, culture, Judaic culture, black, Judaic, African, Afro-Shemitic culture, really all about. All right? So this particular book here, too, is also very, very important. So this particular Sabbath is the the RSS right the RSS number 40 and it's known as Balak Balak right Obama Rinya as Ba La Balak right You can see it right there. Balak. 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 You can make that shorter. Balak. Right? Balak. Balak. Now, who is Balak and what is Balak all about? And why is this Torah portion so very crucial for us? Now, it's a continuation, of course, from the 39th. And those who do have a copy of this, or you can check out a corresponding. Um, version of it on the Wikipedia if you put in Balak and the Torah portion into your search it will take you to the wiki the Wikipedia and Balak right Balak is on page 302 so let's go over Balak Balak uh, Balak and we're gonna get into the name of Balak as well we're gonna get into the names in this portion the names as based on the interpretation in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, if you already are familiar with the basic story, if you've been studying at least a cycle or two or more, you already understand the basic story in this Torah portion, which um, constitutes Numbers chapter 22 and 2 to Numbers chapter 25 and 9. Now, we as black Jews, Afro Shemites, as Ethiopian Hebrews, and elect and faithful Aras Tefari, we are. Uh, read this in the diaspora, read it in late June or July, in late June or July, and it's the 40th weekly Torah portion that we know as the Orit. The Orit is the Ethiopic for Torah, and, and Minbab is reading, it means reading, or Nibab, Nibab, like Nibabate, the house of reading and usually this is read by one one would read the portion and where it's necessary to interpret there'll be another interpreter first Corinthians chapter 14 Hawari of Alos he speaks of that particular order in the Mahibur 
you know saying, based on that ancient order in the synagogue and based on that ancient order in the tabernacle, in the tabernacle worship of the Beit Israel. Now, usually, this portion is combined with a chukat. It's combined with the previous portion when it's necessary to um, achieve the appropriate number of weekly readings because of the um, unique lunar solar um, Hebraic calendar, and that too based scripturally Genesis chapter 1 verse 14. The sun, the moon, the stars are not to be worshipped, for they are for signs, seasons, days, and years, so that we be in the proper timing and proper order, as above, so below. All right? Now, the summary of this is, is four parts. One, Balak, he invites Balaam. That's the next name. There's the Balaam and the donkey section. There's Balaam's blessing, even though he was a soothsayer, uh, of, like an obiaman in a sense. He was meant to curse, but he had to bless. The fourth part is the sin of Baal, Baal Peor, Baal Poria, Baal Peoria, I sometimes say, but Baal Peor. So there's four major matters that must be addressed in this Rastafari sabbatical study, Torah portion number 40, Balak, right? Balak. Now there's also the half. Tara. There's the Haftara, which is something similar to the Missa in, in the churches where they give you the, the closing when everyone is leaving. There's a, there's a closing portion that ones are to go home with. And that's what we know as the Haftara, or we call it the uh, Nabiyat. The Nabiyat. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called the Nevim, which is more properly the Nabim. And that means the prophets. Now, the Haftara for this Padishah for this reading is Micah chapter 5 verse 6 to Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Now when Parsha, when this portion is combined with the previous one, Chukat or Yehigu to Izaz, Yehidno, the Nabiyat, it remains the, I mean this, this Nabiyat, it remains in Nabiyat. This particular reading from Micah chapter 5 verse 6 to Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Now in this, uh, Nabiyat or Haftara in Micah chapter 6 verse 5, Micah, Micah the prophet Micah, known to some as the minor prophet, he quotes Jah's admonition to the Beit Israel to recall, recall the events of the Parsha. So in the prophet Micah, he's saying to Ainai Beit Israel to remember, to have total recall of what occurred in this particular Parsha, quote, to remember now what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. Now, the verb in the Haftarah, in the Masoretic Hebrew, that it uses for answer, which is ana, in Micah 6 and 5, is a variation of the same verb that the Parsha uses to describe Balaam's answer. Vaya an, vaya an. So we have ana, vaya an, and so it's linked the same verb to Balak in the parsha Numbers chapter 22 and 18, and in Numbers chapter 23 and 12. And the first words of Balaam's blessing. So Balaam, he was hired. He was a hired soothsayer, sorcerer, obia man to curse the Beit Israel. But when he went into the spirit world or, or the psychical world, Jah met him and Jah says, you are to bless them. So he could not curse the Beta Israel, even though that was his usual job. He had to do something different than his job description and to bless Beta Israel in Numbers chapter 24 and 5. He says, how goodly, matov, matov in the Hebrew, mato, or matovu, matovu. In the Hebrew, that's what it said in Numbers chapter 24 and 5. Now these are echoed in the Haftarah of the Nabiyat, the prophetical reading for this 40th portion's admonition in Micah 6 and 8 about Matov, what is good, what is good. So we have Matovu in the Hebrew that would mean how goodly, Matovu, how goodly. And if you say Matov, is to ask the question, Matov. What is good? 
what is good or speak about what is good in Jah's sight, namely to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, with Ha Elohim Baruch Hu. Now this is very, very important. Even this three parts, this trinity here, to do justly, to do that which is just, the fitta, the fitta, to love mercy, to love meheret, and to walk humbly, to walk humbly with, with, along with your God. And this is what we are to do, to do justly, to love mercy, mercy and to walk humbly with Ja Rastafari with the King of Kings in the name of our Black Lord and Savior, the Mushia Yeshua. Get touching Jesus Christos. Now, that's that's a kind of an over that's an overview right there. Now there's some details about this that we'd like to get into more details and discuss coming forward. But one of the first aspects we need to do about this story, besides getting a basic overview. Now, I'm not sure how many of you all have read this story before or really understand, you know, this particular story. In other words, I don't know how many are really doing their homework. You might be listening to these vids, but it's important for you to go over the reference points yourself. You understand? And if you don't have this particular book right here, at least to read that portion in the Bible. You understand? To read that portion in the Bible. Individually, if you're so-called by yourself, you're not really alone if you have true faith. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is with you too. And that means the community, even if we are here or there in spirit and in truth, we are not alone. You know what I'm saying? So we have to look upon these things iritically. We have to look upon these things spiritually. We have to look upon these things according to his oracle, according to the word of John. We, that's how we have to receive Kabbalah it. And that right there is I and I personal responsibility. You see, that that's, that's where it deals, there's some aspects of the faith that we do have to do something, even if it is to have faith. And that is the work of God. The work of God for us is to have faith. That means true and faithful witness. And see, if we have faith and we begin with the true faith, then the next thing is to study and to learn and to grow. You understand? And then the fruit of that is in I and I walk. It's in I and I behavior. It's in, it's in I and I liberty, as we would say, as Rastafari. And once we go through those basic steps, then unity, then inity is already there. Inity is very easy to manifest, but it begins with the instruction of I and I Father and the law of I and I Mother as per Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. You'll say, first of all, learn, well, what are those things? You know, you know, what does that mean? Who are we? You understand? And there's a message here for the Beta Israel, the ethnic people, the Afro Shemites, the blacks, as well as for the other Gentile, European, so forth and so on, nations. And I know I said I was going to touch on a, a, a teaching of that. What does the word say? How are we to, how are we to truly deal with the Gentiles? I'm talking about the, the righteous Gentiles or the Gentiles who recognize. You also know this, the testimony of non-Hebrews, a non-Beta Israel, who even though their people were, were bad or became wicked against the Beta Israel, there were a few, you know, saying, amongst them who were righteous. What is the standard? What is the standard? Now, it's very interesting in this particular portion. In this particular portion, when it speaks about the sin of Baal Peor, it introduces Phineas. Phineas is introduced in this particular Torah portion. And if you look over the older vids that we had published previous, or the previous vids that we had published, um, and you look up the RSS number 40 or Balak, if you look in, in our video library or the Ethiopian World Net, and you look up Balak, right? Looking up Balak, you'll find one of the older word pick videos, I think perhaps from last year, if not the year before. 
And if you look over that again, we start to break down that in, 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 in context with where they had come out, that the name Sini Haas is interesting because we can break it down Ethiopically, afro shemitically but also we can see how it has its Egyptian reflections in it. Remember, John says that Egypt is my people. So just as the Beit Israel, also spoken of as Jah's people, the Egyptians, according to the word, the Bible, are his people, Isaiah chapter um, 19. And we went over that in, in, in uh, previous um, reasoning um, concerning the Rastafari Pyramid Code. You understand? And those series of reasonings, we've touched on that right there. What does that mean? How do we interpret that? Well, then, if Egypt he calls his people, then how can he call Beta Israel his people? The key is he has called out of Egypt his son, his son. Now, in order for us to really fully understand the context of this, we have to understand the mysteries, though the ancient mythology, not the way the world teaches us. Not Egyptology the way the world or the Goyim or the Gentiles teach us, you know, but the way that reflects truly both the racial identity, you know, of the people. See, the, the racial identity will then point to the cultural influence. And then the cultural influence will also point to the language, the linguistical influence. All right? And then putting all of that together, you know, saying, will give us a proper context. Yobes and will, will, will give us the matters in their proper, in their proper context, in their proper order. Now, we said we have to touch on a few of the names right here, right? We said we had to touch on a few of the names right here. Now, if we still have an opportunity in this reasoning, let's let's deal with some of the names. Now, we already said Balak, so Balak will be the first name, right? Or oh, one the first name, but. Who are the characters in this particular story? Like I said, if you don't know the story, basically, we don't, we're not going to go through all the details of the story right now. They're here in this particular volume. They're in the, in the scriptures. You'll send, in fact, even in this particular chapter right here, if you have the Schofield, the Schofield is very, very important. If there's any first investment that I would say to ones to make is to get a good Schofield reference Bible because it's a basic, it's, it's, it's a very good basic reference. You know what I'm Because everything else we basically fact-checked and spiritually headrest with John based on the Bible, based on the Word, and, and, and through the Holy Spirit, being guided by the Holy Spirit in accordance with the logic or the logos of the Word. Now here there's a footnote on Balaam. Balaam is mentioned first, right? So let us put Balaam here. So we're going to understand what's in the name. Now, there's something very interesting about Balaam, too. Balaam or Bela'am. Bela'am. Right? Bela'am, he's a typical prophet for hire. Today we can call Bela'am a preacher for hire. Today we can call Bela'am, can we say that Bela'am is a prosperity preacher on a certain level in Christianity sense he'll be a prosperity preacher you understand he'll be a he'll be like one of those roaming we don't see he has any congregation in a sense in other words he don't really have people he's like one of those kind of speakers that go around to these different churches and everything you understand preaching this particular prosperity, you know what I'm Because what Balak, he was jealous of the Beit Israel. you know what I'm saying? He saw that they had victories, and there's a couple of victories we didn't get into the details of these particular victories, that they, uh, I think the victory over Sihon and Og, and also Arad, there was also the emissary um, to Adam, which I wanted to touch on, but over this portion didn't get to um, the previous portion get into the details of um, or the inspiration, the revelation, is a particular revelation of that. Um, so, but he's a prophet for hire. 
You understand? He is for hire. The key thing right here, he is for hire. Saying he is for hire is say, well, he is a pro prophet. You understand? Prophet. In what sense of prophet? Well, let's look at this right here. He is a prophet, right, on this level. But really, his main thing is for profit. Right? His main thing is for profit. You see, I love the words right there. He's a prophet for hire. You understand? For hire. He is for hire. Right? He is for hire, which means he is for sale. Right? He is for sale. To the highest bidder? Well, it's obvious to the highest bidder because here we have the king of Moab, the king of Zippor. Of Zippor. I mean, the son of Zippor. Balak. Now, he's a Moabite. Does this, does, does that, is that significant to us today? Well, yeah, a lot of our Moorish brothers and sisters out there, they're, they're Moabites. They say that they are of the Moab nation, those who wear the red fez and stuff like that. Now, we agree with them vis-a-vis -vis the Negro, black, colored, artificial person, natural person, God-given right, so forth and so on. We agree on those basic levels. Those basic things are right and exact, and we need to know more about it. But it's like when Yeshua says to us, observe what they observe, but do not do after their works. In other words, observe that. Observe the law. Recognize the law. Study up on the law. You understand? Um, protect your birthright. But see, our birthright and our so-called Moabite, Moorish brothers' birthright, there's a difference right there. You understand? They do not admit that they are majority-wise Ethiopian. They say they are Moroccans. And so there's a particular agreement, disagreement. Now, it's interesting when you study the relationship between the, the, the Moabites, right? The Moabites and the Israelites. Is there a relationship between the Moabites and the Israelites? Think, think about that for just a brief moment. Make I and I take a little sip. What is Ruth? Remember Ruth? And we published, <coughs> we published, and I say this is also for the sisterhood. We're going to have to touch on that as well. We published um, the book of um, uh, our translation, but an overview of the book of Ruth. Ruth, who was the grandmother of the great King David, she was a Moabitess. Now, in Torah, in the law, there is a, a, a word, uh, uh, a statute that says that a Moabite cannot enter, cannot enter into the congregation of the Lord, of God's people. Now, ones will say, well, how come Ruth entered in? Notice, it will seem like a contradiction to most folks, coming from a Gentile, white, European, Western misunderstanding. But when we put it into its proper context, it becomes clear in the Hebrew and even in the Ethiopic. It says a Moabite, referring to a Moabite, he cannot enter. But a righteous she can enter in. Now, why is that all very important to us? Because in this same particular section, we have the Moabites and we have the Medeanites what we call the original Arabs, black, Ethiopianish, Habasha kind of Arabs, the Medeanites. But then we also have Jethro, right? Jethro was said to be in the land of Medina, or he was the land of Median land, and he's also called Ethiopian. His daughter, Zipporah, is referred to as a what? As an Ethiopian. So we have the Ethiopian slash Medeanite. So one can ask, well, which was they? Were they, was Jethro and his daughter Zipporah, the wife of Moses, were they Medeanites? Like these Medeanites that we read in this 40th Torah portion? Or were they Ethiopians? And so what happens often, even with some of our Hebrew Israelite brothers, you know, they will point to some of the verses where it says, for example, Asa. He, he, he beat Zara or Zara, Zara, the Ethiopian, 
you know what I'm saying, who tried to boast up himself. You know what I'm saying? Some little petty so called African king tried to boast up himself against this Ethiopian black Hebrew people. And he was thoroughly beaten. Jah was on Asa's side. So ones would say, Well, you see that right there? We're not Ethiopians. Now don't be so foolish and doolish. You understand? Know don't be so foolish and doolish. What, what do we mean by that? Not all who are of Israel are Israel, right? Doesn't the Bible say that? That means we have some who are, quote, of Israel, you understand? Know but they are not spiritually Israel. So that's why we should not just look at this in the sense of just so-called only racially. There's a racial dynamic. We should not just look at it in terms of national too or nationality. How does Elasi the first? He says something very interesting in the ultimate challenge utterance. He has an utterance where he says the ultimate challenge. Where are we to look for to for answers to questions? that have what that have never been asked before now in that particular in that particular utterance of the king of kings let's see if we we just had this we just had it open over here and okay here it goes right here let's see if we can find that it's a very important utterance right because it kind of matches exactly what the Bible, it, it reinforces the Holy Scriptures. Um, it reinforces um, what the Holy Scripture says. It, it, it shows us the, the living reality. In other words, the Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, he was not afraid or ashamed, you understand, to proclaim his living faith before the nations and also show that if they would follow even their um, claim to being Christian, you understand, or claim to being of Christ or people of the book, you understand, then they would operate in a different spirit, and this world situation would not be, you understand, in the situation that is in presently, and 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 at that time it wasn't even as bad as it is today. So it's the same speech where His Majesty says, um, "Until the philosophy which holds one race superior and another inferior." I think it's it's the it's the final part of that particular speech. This is a new book, so um, it just looks so fresh. Everything looks so fresh and new. We 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 don't know if we'll be able to find it right here, but um, he, he said that we should not owe our legion. What I recall is that. He said we should not owe our allegiance to to nations. To here it goes right here to nations. So we're going to share just a, a little bit of this from the ultimate challenge of Hollis Lives the first, and in this right here on um, selected speeches, it's on page um, 377. The ultimate challenge. He says when I spoke at Geneva or Geneva in 1936, there was no precedent for a head of state addressing the League of Nations. Before His Majesty spoke before the League of Nations, it was not a common practice for other heads of state. Heads of states would not speak at, at such a thing as the League of Nations. They would send some ambassador or somebody else. So His Imperial Majesty showed that, that humility as well. But now, today, it has become a practice. Like, it's like when we show the, 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 the Trinity hand. And you see everybody kind of doing it nowadays in the media. But from time before, it seemed like as though it was only him and very few that did it knowingly or unknowingly. But he said there was no precedent for a head of state addressing the League of Nations. I am neither the first nor will I be the last head of state to address the United Nations. But only I have addressed both the League and this organization in this capacity. So the role that his imperial majesty played in the sense in their old attempt, right, and in the new attempt. Remember, the determination of Yahweh, the determination of the Lord was to gather the nations together. So it's no accident that we have the so-called League of Nations and the United Nations today. And it's no accident that his imperial majesty, Kedamawi, Haile Selassie, Haile Selassie I, of Ethiopia, the King of Kings, 
was so instrumental and involved because Ethiopia, our Judeo-Christian divine heritage was the first victim. You know what I'm saying? You want to speak about a Holocaust? Great. Speak about your Holocaust. I and I must speak about I and I Ethiopian Holocaust because in many, in many overt ways the plague has continued even to the lost sheep over here in the Americas. So his magic goes on to say the problems which confront us today are equally unprecedented. They have no counterparts in human experience. So a lot of things that we're dealing with right now, you know, are unprecedented according to the recorded history of humanity. You cannot find prior times where the same sort of circumstances, situation, problems that are confronting us have been before. His Majesty said that men, men search the pages of history for solutions. People are looking through history for solutions. For precedence, well, this happened then, we can learn from that, look at now, but there are none. There are none. This then is the ultimate challenge. This then is the ultimate challenge. Where are we to look for our survival? Where are we as humanity, as children of God? Where are we to look for our survival? For the answers to the questions which have never before been posed. I mean, we're dealing with questions in this present time which have never in the recorded history of humanity been posed before. What, what is Kedemawi Haile Shilase's answer? What is Kedu Sabatachin's answer? He says, we must look first to Almighty God, to El Shaddai, to Hulun Chai Amlak, Hulun Yamichil Amlak, Kahaile Kulu. You know what I'm saying? We must look to the Almighty God who has raised, who has raised, that idea of the resurrection, who has raised man above the animals, above the animals, and endowed him with intelligence and reason. Now, see, this proves that at a this proves that evolution, in principle, what we know today in the world is evolution, you know, is a false god, is a false religion, and the god of Charles Darwin is a chimp. You know, it's a false god and a false... Why do we say that? Because the magic says that man has been raised. You can say he's been evolved, he has been raised. Now, the word evolution is not a bad word, but the connotation of evolution today is a false religion. It's like when we say Christianity. So much of Christianity as Christianity exists in the world is counterfeit to the teaching of the founder, to the teaching of the master, to the teaching of the Moshiach, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we must first look to the Almighty God. And notice how he uses Almighty God which is almost going back to the patriarchal times, the Abrahamic times, if you know the different names of God and how different names were revealed in different times, then it's interesting when you look at the use of the Almighty God because, again, Almighty God comes up in the book of um, Revelation in, in, in a key, significant way like here. But there's other chapters in, in the Bible, even based in the translation, where you don't find Almighty God, but you see it introduced, which would be El Shaddai. El Shaddai. The Blue Letter Bible on the Internet is interesting. They have this, um, I guess they've gone through a new promotion, but they have names of God there. So if you all who are online and do some studies and follow up, go to the Blue Letter Bible and look at their, their featured section, Names of God. I think they're on Adonai, or Adoni, Adonai, at this present time. But they dealt with El Shaddai previously, and it was, it was pretty interesting. You know, remember, that particular site there has the Bible studies online where one can, you know, you can really go into the Septuagint, the Greek, the Masoretic Hebrew, the Jesenius, um lexicon, Thaler's lexicon, Strong's concordance. You can get to some of the... The, the, the best study material in, that's available of, of biblical scriptural studies in the English language. 
you understand, in, on those particular sites because they have, you know, the, the software integrates a lot of these different, you know, pro, these different books into a programming format that once you just get the wing of it, you understand, practice makes perfect. All right, my brothers and sisters, may, may Christ, through Christ, we can do all things. In the Moshiach, we can do all. So we must look first to the Almighty God who has raised man above the animals. So we are raised, we're not animals. So you can see that what happened in, in humanity, I mean, on a spiritual level, they devolved. They devolved, in a sense. You understand? In other words, they started to look at the animals, in a sense, as gods. You have to understand. Instead of the animals as symbols, you understand, of the wisdom of God, they looked at the animals themselves as gods. And this is a devolution or a devil, a demonic evolution, or a downgrading, in other words. The King of Kings says we must look first to the Almighty God who has raised man above the animals and endowed him with intelligence and reason. This is almost Kabbalistic in a sense if you look at the Tree of Life. Intelligence and reason. We must put our faith, our faith in Him. We must hitch our imnet to He who is the Amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Our imnet is, is our, our objective, um, 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 our subjective faith, and He is the object. He is the faith. His name is the Amen. According, He is the true Amen. You understand? But even in ancient times, you had the true Amen. But then you also had the bondage form of religios or religion. You understand? By the priest. This priest class. Now, looking at this guy, this guy, in a sense, uh, Belaam, he, in a sense, would be like one of those who, in, in New Testament times, on a certain level, was like the Jews if you think about it, you understand, because they had gone away from the purity of the faith, and this is what the Moshiach, what Yeshua, what Jesus Christos, had come to save his people from themselves. It's almost like I and I ministered to Rastafari and a lot of the Rastas, you understand, going their own way away from John's way. We are seeking to help save I and I people from themselves, from doing the things their own way and remind them to do it Jah's way. So here his master says that we must put our faith in him, that he will not desert us or permit us to destroy humanity which he created in his image. We must look into ourselves. So he didn't say like the worldly people first say, this is what Bala um Balaam. Remember the, the Bible in the New Testament, it speaks about the sin of Balaam and then it speaks about the doctrine of Balaam, which are two very fundamental points and, 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 and they're very important. There's some word pictures I like to show you. Not in this this format I can't show you. We don't have the technology in this particular format. But what we're gonna do, Yah willing, is touch on that from the Revelation two seven dot org. Revelation27.org, there's a, there's a particular um, um, article there, I think it's chapter 11, um, the nature and the name of the beast might be the particular article. And it touches on Balaam in a particular prophetic way, a particular prophetic way. And the scriptures remind us how important prophecy is. Because we can speak in the so-called unknown to you all or to some of you all um, language, the Amharic, the Royal Amharic, yes. But it's better to be able to interpret, to interpret this. And he says that prophecy, because we're, what we're doing is showing John's word is true, is true, is true. You understand? And it has a relevance even on the present reality. And if we choose to make our wolves obedient to good influences, we can see it. There it is. It is what it is. You understand? But the choice 
is ours. That's the key thing. The cho though we would like uh, human beings unregenerated, we, we blame everybody. But really, when we hear the truth and we do not make our wills obedient to it, we only have ourselves to blame. But with his life is hope. You know what I'm saying? You know, with his life is still hope. So we, we hope and pray those of y'all who are, you know, wrestling will seek him who has overcome and who is able to help us overcome, provide that way of escape for whatever, whatever, whatever it is. All power has been given to our elder brother, our big brother, the black Messiah, Yeshua, HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos. You understand? And not to us only, you understand? But isn't it obvious to even the faithful among the Gentiles? Isn't it obvious? He says, we must put our faith in him that he will not desert us or permit us to destroy humanity which he created in his image. In his image. We must look into, into not just at ourselves, we must look into ourselves, into the depths of the depth of our souls, and we'll go deep. You know, when we read and study this and we talk about this, do you take the time to say, okay, what, what resonance, what can I get at, what can I learn from this? You know what I'm saying? What am I doing right according to the true teaching and interpretation of this, and what am I doing wrong? And what do I need to work out in Christ? You know what I'm saying? What do I need to pray on? Ask for the wisdom and the strength on, you know what I'm saying, to overcome. We must become something we have never been, in which our education and experience and environment have ill prepared us. You know why I love that particular line right there, that utterance? Because he sums it up. He sums it up. Even for I and I right now, well, let's go over that line one time. One time. He says, um, we must become, he says, we must look into ourselves, into the depth of our souls. This is what the scriptures tell us as well. You understand? First he said, look to the Almighty, now look into ourselves. We must become something we have never been. You understand? We have never been born again until we are born again. You know what I'm saying? And we become something we have never been. We have never been children of God until we become children of Jah. We have never been. You know what I'm saying? And for which our education, because this is not taught in schools. I mean, they have theology and theological studies, so forth and so on. But, but, but that being what it is, you know, that is what it is. That doesn't prepare us for the teaching of his majesty and his Christ. And experience, an environment. So our education, our experience, what most folks have experienced on a regular basis, seems 180 degrees opposite of what we are preaching or proclaiming on a certain level, especially the hope, the expectation, the overcoming, the kingdom age. You know what I'm saying? It seems, it seems from this vantage point as though it's far, far away. An environment. Our experience, so education, experience, environment. I mean, much more, you know, you can meditate on this and even see more things into this that are so relevant. And that's what makes you understand that the utterances of His Majesty are not just like no ordinary speech. You know, not like no ordinary talk or no ordinary lecture. You know, and they are teaching. They're almost sci they're scientific. We've done this before in many of our notes elsewhere and in other studies of brothers and sisters, taking like a speech like this, a portion of it, and break it down, and even add other evidence that proves that this is like, this is like a scientific formula right here. You know, and this is like math, this is science, this is dealing with, you know, dealing with psychology, philosophy, it's dealing with real subjects and real truth, and the core of it always refers is self referential to Christ, to God, to the Bible, to the truth. You understand? But in a realer way than anything else we have found, come across, or experienced. This is how we know him, the King of Kings and his Christ. Right? So we've been ill prepared. 
not well prepared. Others are well prepared for everything they're doing in their societies and cultures. But because of who we are, as a peculiar people, we have been ill prepared. His master said that we must become bigger than we have been. Because we've been unregenerated, we've been petty, little, you know what I mean, to the point that a movement like Rastafari has been in a seeming state of inertia, you understand, for almost 40 years. We must become bigger than we have been, more courageous, greater in spirit. Love that phrase, greater. We have spirit, yes, I and I, Rastafari, but greater in the true spirit. You see, and, and that is all. Christ is the key. Yeshua is the key. Larger in outlook. You know what I'm saying? Larger, be able to see the full picture, the full vision. You know, in the fullness of the vision. He says, we must become members of a new race. Yes, we must. The race of the children of God. Period. The race of the children of God. We must become members of a new race overcoming petty prejudice. You know, when you look at a lot of the kind of things, uh, racism and prejudice, and uh, 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 it's really petty. It's really petty, yet, yet it, it, it leaves and has left a deep scar that can only be healed by the true healer, by the true physician, the physician of our souls, Yeshua HaMoshiach, Yesus Christos, Simu Yitzvarek, L'ul Yitzbarak, his name is blessed. The Most High be blessed. Overcoming petty prejudice, owing our ultimate allegiance, our ultimate allegiance, not to nations, but to our fellow men, our fellow men within the human community. October 6th, 1963. Amen. Amen. Now, I know this was um, this was um, a little bit, might seem on a certain level, a little bit out of context to some. But if it doesn't seem that way to you who are viewing and listening to this, well, that means, well, you, you recognize why we went there. We had to go there because, you see, often if we talk about the Edomites, Right, right now, some are going to go to a, a an undisciplined extreme, Yovas, and they're going to miss the point. If we speak about the Moabites and connect the Moabites with the Moorish, some too will go to an undisciplined extreme, not recognizing uh, there are almost two sides to the story in a sense. Remember the Edomites? I've gotten into this with some Hebrews like. Um, brothers, you know, I call them brothers even though they might hate on I and I because of Hila Selassie the first. You understand? I and I still regard them as, um, as, as dear brothers. In the same way that Hawari Aulos regarded, regarded um, those Hebrews and Jews that didn't want to accept the Moshiach as being Yeshua. They didn't want to accept that. Like many of our Hebrew Israelites cannot accept or don't want to accept or have not accepted that the black Messiah is Kedemawi Haile Selassie, that he is the one. You understand? And, and part of it, part of the reason why some may not be able to accept this reality is because many wolves in sheep clothing have gone out there and have for lack of a better word, perpetrated a fraud. You understand a lot of the Rastaism and schism that has gone out there. A lot of things have been said in His Imperial Majesty's blessed name that has nothing to do with His clear and evident teaching. Cannot be backed up by anyone who knows the truth of the King of Kings and His Christ. All right? So, we have to understand that. We have to pray. You understand for them because they are I and I brothers and sisters. You understand they are I and I brothers still because the foundation is still the same. We are Hebrews. We are Beta Israel. We are those people. 
You understand? We are those people. Now, who are the other people? Who are the other people that we're talking about? We're talking about the Moabites, the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Medeanites. Now, some will say, well, that just proves there's good and bad in, in every race or in every nation. And so true, true, so true. Jah is a lover of humanity. Remember, he is the creator of all of these creatures. We have to understand that. He is the creator of all of these creatures, of all these races, of all these nations. So when the king of kings tells us not to have allegiance to nations, because he says there's no nation that is higher than any other nation, with the exception of the kingdom of the Lord. You know that. Don't you know that? That there's no nation is higher, but the only nation that is higher than all other, or the only kingdom, rather, that is higher than all other kingdoms, the only government, it's higher than all other governments, or the gov is the government of the Lord, which is interpreted to be understood as the kingdom of the King of Kings and his Christ, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jah, and that is I and I, Father's kingdom, and that is I and I, divine heritage. So let us understand this, all right? I just think it's very important just to make that particular note because in some further reasonings 